let's turn together in joyous need to our God in prayer. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come to you today as a congregation, as a gathered body, as your people. And we come to you not in, because of any good in us, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Father, we pray today for those in our body who are in need. We see some of them and some of the needs, but Father, you see all of them. And we trust the needs of this body to you, O oh God. Father, we pray this morning for those who are struggling with joy this Christmas season. Really, any season. Father, we pray for those who are struggling with anxiety and depression in our congregation. We intercede on their behalf. Oh God, would you bring them hope and joy in Jesus Christ? Would you be near to them, oh God? And would you bring a peace that passes all understanding? Father, we pray this morning on behalf of the worldly family who have been sick this week. As sickness goes through their home, we pray that you would bring healing, and we pray that you would strengthen the worldlies. We thank you for the gift that they are to our body and the ways that Stephen serves so graciously with our children, many times unnoticed. Thank you for his kind care, and would you strengthen him today? Father, today we pray on behalf of those who have come in and are struggling with besetting sin. Father, for those that feel trapped by the deceitfulness of sin in their lives, Father, we pray for freedom. We pray, O oh God, that they would know that there is no combination for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that because of that, that they would reach out for help to a brother or sister this morning. Father, may we be a church that is honest about our sin and seeks the help of others and repents. Father, as we also give to Lottie Moon this morning, we pray for the work of the gospel among all nations. Oh God, this, this glorious news of Jesus Christ that we have, we desire for this to go to all peoples. And we pray that you would do that through your servants who are going out around the world. Father, we pray that as we give to this Lottie Moon Christmas offering, that you would use these funds to further the gospel, oh God. And we pray for our church to grow in our ability to, and eagerness and zeal to think widely about your cause among the nations and to invest ourselves well in the coming months and years in the work of missions. Grow us, we pray, oh God. Lastly, Father, we want to come and pray for our church body, especially as we come together as members this evening in, a, in our meeting, and then as we look to get to know Caleb and Leah later this week. Oh God, would you grant us all discernment and all wisdom? Father, would you grant us as a church a great deal of unity? Father, would you grant us the ability to work together as a healthy church? that the elders would listen well to the congregation and would lead faithfully with integrity, that the congregation would see and discern with all wisdom and would speak readily to our elders and would be busy about the work of ministry, O oh God. Father, would you grow our church in this season to be healthier and more centered around the good gospel of Jesus Christ? We need you to do this in us. Do this even now as we come to your word. May we sit under it and be taught and learn. Father, we rest on your words, not on my words, but on the very words of God from scripture. Would you teach us this morning, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, William Henley was a man born in Gloucester, England in 1849. You probably don't know him. At the age of 12, he was diagnosed with painful tubercular arthritis. 
He lived a very painful life in extreme pain and eventually had his leg amputated, though he still continued for years in discomfort. Notably, he was known for being defiantly strong and trying to be happy, to be joyful, despite the life of pain that he had. He was also a poet. At the age of 26, he wrote a poem, which you might have heard of, called Invictus. It ends with these famous lines. He writes, it matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Is this true? Now, this is certainly the perspective of our day. This is the spirit of the age that regardless of pain, regardless of trouble, regardless of what happens to us, our happiness, our blessedness is linked to our choice, our autonomy, our ability to be captain of our souls and masters to ourselves. But let me ask you today, is, is personal authority truly the path to joy? Does joy come from truly being our own masters? As a church, we've been studying the book of Luke this Christmas season. We've started into this series, and we've heard last week of Gabriel's message to Mary, announcing the birth of Christ coming through her. And this incredible story began with this young teenage girl. So we return to it today. If you have your Bibles, open to Luke chapter 1. We're going to walk through the next section of this story, of Mary's story, and it considers Mary in detail. It's, it, it focuses our attention for this passage less on the person of Christ and his coming and more on this, this servant that God is using to bring Christ into the world. And we see a path to joy that is quite the opposite of mastering our own fate and being captain of our own ships. Here's the lesson that we see in one sentence from this story. Mary is blessed as she submits to God in faith and responds in joyful worship. Mary is blessed as she submits to God in faith and responds in joyful worship. We'll look at these, these themes throughout the text. There's many themes. I'm just picking three to highlight today. So submission, faith, and worship, as you see right there in that sentence. All three are put just on display in the life of Mary. So first, Mary is blessed as she submits to God. Return with me to that village. Do you remember where we were last week? We were at this, this small village out in, of Galilee, and this, this angel, Gabriel, was announcing this king. And he was announcing it to this young girl. And this girl would give birth as a virgin to the Son of God. Last week we talked about how this was an act of grace, of favor to Mary, and an unmerited kindness that she didn't deserve. But in order to feel the weight of this, as we, we step back into where we left off last week, consider the reality of what this would mean for this young girl. She was just a young teenager. She's being told that she will now have a child outside of marriage. In the eyes of others, this could be scandalous. It certainly would be scandalous. Think of the stigma that would be attached to her life now. Think of what it would be like for her as the months go by and as she begins to no longer be able to hide this pregnancy from watching eyes. I wonder if all of this was just racing through her mind as, as Gabriel departed from her, as Gabriel spoke to her. I wonder if she realizes the impossibility for anyone else to believe this story when they see her pregnant. Who will gossip about her behind her back? What about Joseph? What, what will Joseph think? Will he divorce her? Will he do so publicly? 
Will she be ashamed? Will she be left alone? We see her first response in verse 38. This is where we left off last week. I want to pick up there this week. Look back at verse 38. We read, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. This is Mary's first response. Mary submits. She submits. Without any record of hesitation or complaint, what we are told is that she immediately submits to this plan of God. Let it be to me according to your word. I want to pause here on this very first verse because I think it sets up well the rest of the passage. You see, this word submit is my summary for what I understand is happening in this verse. Biblically, submission is handing over your will to come under the authority of another. This is submission. Handing over your will to come under the authority of another. And this is what Mary is doing before God. She is taking the posture of a servant. She is not hesitating. She is putting herself under the authority of what God has said for her. Now, even as I say this word, submission, I recognize that this is, this is really not an American value. After all, we are a land of democracy, are we not? We are much more prone to emphasize our rights, our individual authority. We have a Bill of Rights. We actually were founded as a nation on wanting our own sovereignty. And it's in our language as well. I, I think that submission is generally not a, a positive word. I'm curious if your neighbors or your friends would think of submission as a good thing. We don't speak of beautiful submission or honorable submission. In English, we speak of being beaten into submission or being asked for just blind submission, don't we? And this is in our culture. The very word submission is antithetical to what we value. Because in our culture, choice matters, does it not? Choice is what is ultimate. My agency, my authority to do as I please. If Mary had been in our culture, perhaps the common mantra for this unwanted child would be, my body, my choice. And yet, friends, so much of the Christian life is developing a heart of verse 38. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to me. Let it be to me according to your word. So I wonder, is verse 38 something that you can say in your life? Oh, this is radically cross-cultural, counter-cultural to our day. Now, most of us in this room are uh, not like Mary. Most of us are not about to give birth to the Son of God. Uh, most of us actually won't, aren't in the midst of facing a, a giant scandal in our lives or facing the scrutiny that she would endure, or having her husband walk away from her. And yet I would submit to you that there are likely a thousand other areas in your life that are smaller areas, but that still we must regularly choose to trust God's sovereignty as we submit to his will as we put ourselves under his authority. So if submission is handing over your will to come under the authority of another, how are you doing at submitting as a servant to what God has planned for your life? My wife shared with me this quote from Elizabeth Elliot. I found it helpful here. Elizabeth Elliot says, To love God is to love his will. It is to wait quietly for life to be measured by one who knows us through and through. It is to be content with his timing and his wise appointment. So do you love the will of your sovereign God in your life, regardless of what it means for you? Are you content with his timing and with his sovereign appointment in your life? 
At Christmas, everyone is happy to celebrate a season that promises joy. But are you happy to look to a God that demands your submission? Well, following this statement, let's move on. Mary gets up, and she, she goes off traveling to visit her relative, Elizabeth. Verse 39. Listen as I read this paragraph, which tells us more of Mary through this, this month with Elizabeth, with this time with Elizabeth. Verses 39 through 45, we read, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the, the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. All right, so Mary here gets off and goes quickly in haste. Here the stories of, of Luke 1 are connecting. We had already heard about Elizabeth and her miraculous conception as a barren woman, and we then heard about Mary, and here they come together, they meet. So Mary runs off in haste, and you can almost feel the pressure of the moment as the reality of this is setting in on Mary, and she's running off. Because thankfully, Mary had just been told by the angel about Elizabeth. One observer pointed out that Elizabeth was the one person that Mary knew could understand the enormity of this moment. And that's exactly what happened. As Mary approached Elizabeth's house and greets her, the moment that Elizabeth's ears hear the voice of Mary, John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb. Verse 44 tells us that he leaped for joy in her womb. So Elizabeth then interprets that this kick wasn't a coincidence. What a powerful moment here. Do, do you remember what the angel Gabriel had said to Zechariah back in the temple in Jerusalem? Do you remember what had happened back in verse 15 a couple weeks ago when we saw that this child that was to be born to Elizabeth would be, verse 15, filled with the Holy Spirit? even from his mother's womb? Here, the angel's words are actually coming to pass, just as he said. John leaps at Mary's arrival, and Elizabeth understands it as joy. It seems that God's power is working, even in this unborn baby, to joyously recognize the arriving Savior. As many have commented, John is already beginning his role as a prophet, announcing the arrival of the Messiah. Well, if the Holy Spirit is at work in John, we see that he was also at work in Elizabeth. Look at verse 31. She is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaims with a loud voice, blessings on Mary. Now, now catch this interesting point of what we read from Elizabeth's mouth. It seems that from the text... At this point, Elizabeth hasn't yet heard of the coming of Christ. After all, she didn't hear Gabriel's message, and she hadn't likely received any advance notice from Mary, and it, it appears at least that Mary herself is just walking in the door. And miraculously, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she begins to prophesy. A couple of things are happening in this beautiful prophecy as, as I've already noted, Elizabeth explains John's leap in the womb as, as this response of joy. Elizabeth prophesying about John recognizing the mother of her Savior. And then, as we see repeated again, Elizabeth prophesies that Mary is a blessed woman, as Elizabeth is also a blessed woman because of her arriving. She is favored by God. This is similar to what we saw last week in the passage. I'm not going to spend much time on it here, 
But it's, it's the same idea that just as last week the angel had said more than once, Mary is favored because of her role. Here, more than once, Elizabeth says, you are, you're blessed. You are blessed as the mother of the Messiah. But then notice a third important part of this prophecy. Elizabeth explains to us that Mary's response was a response of faith. Do you see that in the text? So, so verse 45 we read, Blessed is she, Mary, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is key to what is happening here. Back to my original sentence. Mary is blessed as she submits to God in faith. She submits to God in faith. It seems that verse 45 is Elizabeth prophetically offering commentary on what was happening with, Elizabeth, with Mary the week before, or last week for us. It seems that, that God had through the angel, spoken to Mary and predicted the birth of Christ. And in that sense, Elizabeth's telling us what is happening in Mary's heart as the angel was speaking. See, from the outside, we see her submission in verse 38. We see her voice of saying, let it be to me. Let me submit to the, God's plan. But what here, what we see, is what's happening on the inside as she submitted. According to verse 45, she had faith. She believed what God said would happen. She believed that God actually would give her a child as a virgin, and that that baby would be the Son of God. Elizabeth is saying that Mary took God at his word. Now, don't miss the contrast of this whole chapter here. See, Elizabeth's own husband had just done the opposite, right? Do you remember what happened in, in, earlier in chapter 1? Zechariah had also received a visit from Gabriel. Zechariah had also received a birth announcement. And again, we had a commentary on Zechariah's heart back in verse 20. And his response was that he did not believe. He heard the word of God and did not believe what he heard. And Mary stands in contrast to that. Mary is being held up as an example of belief. And not only that, we see here a piece of how obedience works. So it, Mary here not only models submission, she models submission through faith. It, for the Christians here in this room, as you're trying to live before God and wanting to be sanctified, growing in obedience before God, this will help you to understand how your sanctification is working. How is it working that you obey God in the Christian life, that you submit to the plan and will of God in your life? Lift up the hood or on the vehicle of true obedience, and what you'll find beneath the hood is that this vehicle is fueled by faith. That's what we're seeing here. Mary believes, and so she submits. This is how obedience works. This is how submission happens. She submitted herself to God's authority, and it was through her faith in what God said. Faith is the active agent of our submission to God. So if you're taking notes here, just jot down Romans 16.26. Romans 16, 26. It's a great cross-reference. Jesus, uh, Paul there, writes of the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. And it's such an interesting phrase. It's not the obedience of duty. It's not the obedience of really trying hard to do the right thing. It's not the obedience of focused effort. No, Paul speaks of this obedience of faith. We submit ourselves to God as we believe God and we take him at his word. Friends, this is just helpful in your life even this week. If you want to obey God with what you're working through in your life, 
What area of, of your life do you need to better submit to what you know Scripture teaches? Let me submit to you. Stop trying on your own. Instead, begin by asking, where are you failing to believe God? Where is there a promise that you fail to trust by faith? Where is there unbelief? Obedience happens as we hear what God says and we believe that it actually will happen. John Piper calls this faith in future grace. He says, faith in future grace becomes the conduit of God's power in our lives as Christians. You submit to his plans not because you purpose hard yourself to do so. You submit because you believe, like Mary, that the grace that he has promised, he will give. You look forward and you trust him by faith. And so you obey. We should move on. Back to my sentence. So Mary is blessed as she submits to God in faith and responds with joyful worship. Next, in, in verses 46 through 56, we see this, this response of worship. Verse 46, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. To magnify is to, to highly honor, to praise the greatness of someone. She says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And, and then she begins this, this beautiful song of praise to God. She, she abrupts with praise to her Savior. It seems, by the way, to be some type of culmination to the faith that Mary has being realized. Gabriel had announced God's plan. He told her about Elizabeth. She had went and seen Elizabeth and saw that what she believed was actually happening. And now she just, she rejoices. She magnifies God. He's doing what he said he would do. Friends, praise is the overflow of true faith. When God's people see who God is and what he's done, we respond in praise. It's what his people do. This is the whole pattern, by the way, of Luke 1 and 2. That's what we're seeing unfold time and again. God's people see and believe and they can't help themselves. They just burst forth in praise. Praise just keeps coming out. It's bursting out. I mean, even John the Baptist, he can't keep still in the womb. And then Elizabeth couldn't keep quiet. She just offers out this loud cry in her own prophetic song. And then Mary just bursts forth with this Magnificat, this song of praise. And then next week, we're going to look back to Zechariah, and we'll see that when he finally gets his voice back, what does he do? He uses it to sing. He bursts forth in praise. When Jesus comes, the angels can't, can't keep quiet. They come as, as multitudes, and they start offering, singing praise to God. And then even after Jesus is here, Simeon in the temple, Jesus is presented in the temple, and he breaks forth in praise. It's like the people of God, when they see Christ, they just can't keep a lid on it. They just, they just let it out. They have to praise God five times, five different hymns, each one celebrating God's coming salvation. Martin Luther described the gospel as glad tidings, good news, welcome information, a shout of something that makes one, to, one want to sing, makes one want to talk, makes one want to rejoice. I wonder if this is how the gospel has worked in your life. Is it true of you? One sign that faith is real in your heart is that you joyfully praise God. So let me just get practical here. Do you sing? Now, I, I know you all just were in this room as we just sang for like 25 minutes. But, but do you lift up your vocal cords and praise God as you reflect on the truth of who God is and what he's done? What's going on in your heart? The reason Christians sing is not because we are musically gifted. The reason we sing when we gather is that we truly believe by faith who God is and what he's doing. And that is worthy, therefore, of praise. 
let me, let me just be honest here. It, just to be candid, this is probably a growth point for the American church. Americans are not very good at this. We, we like to listen to good performances, but, but to sing ourselves loudly and happily and joyfully, well, that makes most of us uncomfortable, just to be honest. Amen. One privilege I've had over recent years has been to travel to just a variety of different countries. As I've been able to worship in many different churches, in many different cultures, I've been so encouraged by seeing churches in Africa and in the Middle East, in, in Central America, gather and understand that the performance of the worship team might be subpar. And the quality of their service doesn't meet our Western standards. But the people, the people themselves, consider it their job to open their mouths and lift up their voices and sing to God. So I've sat in small rooms filled with new believers who understand from Scripture that Christians sing. They sing, not because their voices are perfect, but because God deserves their praise. So sometimes we're learning new songs. I understand that. But when you can, do you lift up your voice and sing? Christians should respond to God. Let us be a church that sings well. Well, what does Mary sing? What does she say? What's the content that she exclaims in praise? Listen as I read her song. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. So Mary here just praises God for who he is and what he has done. By the way, clearly she knew her Old Testament. She quotes here from like eight different books of the Old Testament, putting them together in one song. And she, she praises God for what God has done for her and for what God has done for Israel. She does this meditating on a variety of God's attributes, which you see there in the text, his, his might, his holiness. Now, look at the first four verses here. We'll be brief. Notice how she focuses on what God has done for her. She says, her soul magnifies. Her spirit rejoices. She sees God's character to her. God is her savior and lord. He has looked on her and has been mighty towards her. Mary sees that God has lifted her up from a humble place place of honor for future generations. For Mary, God is not distant or abstract. God has met her with this blessing of being the mother of Christ, and he has honored her. And so his, her relationship with God is personal and real. By the way, teenagers here, youth, you should know, just like Mary, your relationship with God can be real and active. It was for Mary, even at this young age. She knew her God. It can be for you too. And then in the second half of the song, Mary seems to shift, and she praises God for how he works among others, specifically uh, among Israel. She praises God for how he reverses the position, expected positions. So she, so she talks about the proud and the rich and the mighty all brought low before God Almighty. 
God will have no rivals. Those who are mighty in this world, who sit on their, their temporary thrones, will realize that there is ultimately only room for one king. Those who are rich, who have enough on their own, one day will be sent away empty, showing that they actually had nothing all along. Those who are proud, who are self-reliant in their own minds. Do you see that in verse 51? They will lose their own minds. He will scatter their thoughts. This reminded me, as I was talking with a brother this week, of, of the famous king Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, with a throne, with power, and with pride. And God opposes the proud. You know what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar? Daniel tells us that he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, er, Nebuchadnezzar and said, you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. It's going to go crazy. And for seven periods of time will pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he will. See, what Mary is doing in this song is she is re rejoicing that God subverts the pr pride of man. That God is zealous to preserve his own glory. And he does this chiefly in Christ. Philip Ryken explains it this way. Listen to this quote. We, he says, The Son of God had come to establish his rule with justice and his kingdom with might. This meant the overthrow of every proud nation and the humbling of every proud heart. God alone deserves the power and the glory. Therefore, he will subdue everything and everyone that opposes his will. To be specific, he, he must humble the pride of the intellect, the pride of position, and the pride of wealth. God brings low the proud. Mary here is calling us to submit to this God, to look to him in faith, in worship, and not to the things that we would boast in. Listen, uh, perhaps to Martin Lloyd-Jones, another great quote, bear with me. He says this, he says, Can you not see that, that man boasts in, everything that man boasts in, his intellect, his understanding, his power, his social status, his influence, his righteousness, his morality, his ethics, his code, every one of them is utterly demolished by the Son of God. He's speaking about this passage when he writes that. So let me tell you today, church, God opposes the proud because he opposes those that compete with his glory. If, if you're here today and you are not a Christian, you, you haven't yet submitted yourself to the kingship of Jesus Christ, let me tell you, you must realize you are worshiping someone. I would submit that pride is actually a form of worshiping yourself. Pride is our natural human condition. We are all in sin, and we all set up ourselves as the mighty. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came, and he lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we deserve to die. He rose from the grave so that we can come off our proud thrones and submit to his lordship. We can rightly acknowledge that he is on the throne of the universe and not us. If this is new news to you today, I just encourage you, talk to someone today. Talk, talk to one of the other people in this room who understands this gospel message. Talk to myself. I'll be in the back. We would love to just get lunch with you. And, and, and talk to you about or, or find a time that we can get together and talk about this good message of the gospel, this good message of Christ's kingship. He opposes the proud. And so you must come off your throne before he takes you off of it. Well, let me close by noticing another theme in this text. You see, as Mary has been just as Mary had been brought up from this humble estate that she says to be in the mother of God, so also has God done this in Israel. Notice in her song, the humble are exalted, the hungry 
are filled. The, the servant of Israel is helped. Israel is brought from a place of lowliness to glory. This is, the the this is a theme in her song. Think of even our world. Think of our, our films. We love a good rags-to-riches story, do we not? The, the slumdog millionaire or the pursuit of happiness. There's an echo, a desire in us that those who are low will have the chance to be brought up. And the reason is, is this is a biblical desire and trajectory. We'll actually see this throughout the book of Luke. It's a theme throughout Luke's gospel, this reversal of the humble being exalted. And God loves to exalt and use the humble. He loves to use those who are not stealing his glory for themselves. James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. He loves to honor those who fear him, verse 50, from generation to generation. He loves to fill the hungry with good things. Mary exalts God for his divine wisdom in using those who submit to his glory, who humble themselves. I wonder if you need to humble yourself today. Friends, this glorious truth about how God's work, God works through the humble, comes to greatest focus this time of year, does it not? It's when we turn our eyes and focus on the work of Jesus Christ. This is the glory of Christmas. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Christ laid down the riches in heaven and made himself empty for us. Christ took on a humble estate. Christ came down from his throne and he became a servant. The humility that exalts God is perfectly displayed in Jesus Christ. So let us together praise Christ this Christmas season. Let's pray. Father, our hearts join with Mary and we magnify God, our Savior. We praise you, O oh God, for you have been merciful to us. We praise you, O oh God, for you oppose the proud and those who are self-exalted. Father, we praise you for using the humble, and we praise you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his work on our behalf, that he would come humbly as a child for us, that he would set aside his riches, that we in our poverty might become rich. We pray that we would understand that more clearly this Christmas season. We pray this in Jesus' name.